Kia ora, everyone, and welcome to Cobblestone's Chronicles. Well, what a coincidence, because as I came in to the studio, I could hear the music playing on the, you know, what was playing on the radio, and I thought, oh, I recognise that voice. And there it was, my own dear husband, Niels Gedge, singing one of his own compositions, um, The Plymouthton Waltz, and that song, like many folk songs, tells a story. It tells the story of our return to New Zealand after living several years overseas and coming back and um, recreating our life in um, based in Wellington and um, buying a house on in Plymouthton on the hill and having this lovely view out towards the sea after um, some years living in Fiji and then in the UK and having a bit of a um, peripatetic life, shall we say. I think we counted we'd moved 11 times in 10 years, something like that. It was a bit scary, actually. <laughs> I became very expert in packing um, for various reasons. Uh, we moved house, but um, it was lovely to be settled and to be um, in living in such a lovely community as well, because Plymouthton is really a village. And it's a bit like some of the villages in the Wairarapa, in the, you know, it's a real village community. And this morning I was at Cobblestones very early for a photo shoot, because we're doing some new photos. And there was a delightful, delightful, um, event on there today, I discovered, there was all the pupils of Lakeview School are going to be visiting cobblestones. And they're going to be doing all these great activities. They're going to be learning about how our um, forebears used to wash their clothes. They've got a couple of our volunteers are down there at cobblestones. And they got out the old wash tub and the washboards and the old sunlight soap and they're going to wash show the kids how to wash the clothes they also um, the kids are coming down in three groups and they're also going to have a lesson in the schoolhouse with um, a teacher and who's going to show them how the um, kids used to learn in the olden days and um the schoolhouse is a little typical one-room schoolhouse from just outside Tainui. And it has um, a set of the appropriate desks. So the desks go from little tiny ones right up to uh, ones that are really fit for adults to sit in. The tiny ones are for the five and six-year-olds. And they are going to get a lesson in there about and sh and see what they were doing. We'll probably do times tables. I've pretended to be a teacher in the school a few times myself, and um, with some help from real teachers, have gone through the lessons, and it's a huge amount of fun. And the kids really enjoy seeing how they used to learn, and using. We've got a set of old slates and. Um, chalks and pencils so they can actually experience writing on a slate. Um, there's also the church and then of course there's a fire engine which is always a great draw. The fire engine is a 1955 Bedford that was imported and used in Carterton for many years. And Carterton kindly, uh, Carterton Volunteer Fire Brigade kindly donated it to Cobblestones when they had got a replacement fire engine, I must admit, some years ago. Um, they're also going to go into the old house and see how people lived in the house and how they cooked and how many... Ten in the bed was definitely the name of the game because there's only two small bedrooms upstairs for the children and um, they'll have a wonderful time. I really, uh, usually I would be there because it's just delightful seeing how the children really enjoy finding out. And of course it's great for their social history knowledge. So it's part of the curriculum now for to have 
New Zealand Social History, and that's one of the things that we offer at Cobblestones. So if your kids come home tonight and they say, Mum, Dad, guess what I did? I went to Cobblestones Museum today and it was great. Do you want to come back? Bring them back sometime and have a even better look around. So Cobblestones will be full of children today if you're thinking about going and it's worth seeing the little faces light up when they see things and they get the idea about how it works. So it's a lovely, lovely day at Cobblestones today. Okay, so how about we have some music? Now, on um, Monday this week, I went up, no, sorry, Tuesday this week, I went up to Napier. And Nils, Nils and I were buying a caravan. We were buying a very ancient caravan, which we towed back. And we dropped in to see some friends of ours who live in Napier. And they were farmers out in the hill country behind Napier. So I thought in memory of the hill country and the hill country boy that we visited, and of course we could have a cup of tea, here, here we go, Hill Country Boy by Alan Downs. Didn't come on down here for the weather Didn't come on down for the crowds I was looking for a change I reckon that I'd reach the age Time to get on out or to knuckle down Thirty years of pushing that same barrel Trying to make peace with my own mind But that gnawing faded doubt I didn't want to talk about I'm the stranger in my life, I need to know When a boy's born and raised in hill country Where a man's life depends on his own hand Don't question the integrity of a bloke From the hill country, he's at home In a world you don't understand Well there's a sea of blank faces on the pavement Seldom you catch a fleeting smile Contemplate their situation The city living fascination With a treadmill keeping pace from nine till five They keep you on the go, they keep you busy Like a milling mob of mangy mongrel steers If not coming, you are going There's no hesitation showing The inland revenue depends on you when a boy's born and raised in hill country Where a man's life depends on his own hand Don't question the integrity of a bloke From the hill country, he's at home In a world you don't understand Well, a bloke in the music store, he's a trimmer He can make any guitar he's got in there play a tune But when he gave me a blast well, he sat back there and laughed Said I didn't have a clue And he would know I hear it time and again in the city They prefer to hear their own opinion the best They don't hear the truth When it comes to them from you I guess they hear the beat of a different drum When a boy's born and raised in hill country Where a man's life depends on his own hand don't question the integrity of a bloke from the hill country He's at home in a world you don't understand So get on out, you mongrel, get away back Keep out, keep out, keep out, you crazy fool Come in, sit down, stand there, your head strong halfwit It's a waste of time talking to you So they tax what you earn, they tax your spending they got parking wardens to tax your patience too There's a road user charge 
when you register your car Alcohol and gasoline is another screw Keep out, keep out, keep out, you crazy mongrel Get away back on out of there They'll call you up, sit you down, stand there with their hand out The city living depends on you When a boy's born and raised in hill country Where a man's life depends on his own hands Don't question the integrity of a bloke from the hill country He's at home in a world you don't understand Well, I didn't come on down here for the weather Didn't come on down for the crowds I was looking for a change I reckoned that I'd reached the age Time to get on out or to knuckle down Thirty years of pushing that same barrel Trying to make peace with my own mind But the gnawing faded doubt I didn't want to talk about I'm the stranger in my life I need to know When a boy's born and raised in hill country Where a man's life depends on his own hand Don't question the integrity of a bloke from the hill country He's at home in a world you don't understand Don't question the integrity of a bloke from the hill country He's at home in a world where he's a man The Bloke from the Hill Country. That's a great song because that must have been rather what our forefather, our forefathers, um, were like when they came down into Wellington town, because um, it certainly was some time before the wire wrapper was properly um, broken in, as it were. <coughs> and I've got um, an old newspaper here, which um, shows some of the issues that happened. So for example, there's a boy named Paratine who was living uh, near Auckland who found an oil drum and filled it up with water, corked it tightly and put it over a fire. The drum exploded, not surprisingly, and a piece of it struck the boy, cutting off the top of his head. Death was almost in instantaneous. I mean, just such a sad story. There's another one here for Charles Cooper, an elderly man who died at the Lawrence Hospital in Dunedin from injuries received by a log rolling onto him while sp splitting timber. He lay pinned for 24 hours before he was discovered and for some time he refused to be removed to the hospital. Life was definitely dangerous. Uh, I know there's a family story from my husband's family which um, talks about the, um, his great-grandfather, Stephen, who um, was, um, was a, a bushman and was felling trees in the, um, out in the northern Wairarapa, I believe. And um, he, a log, a tree fell on his leg and it was crushed. So they sent him off to Wellington in a cart and nothing was heard from him for more than six months. And everybody believed that he was dead. They thought he must be dead. So, because they hadn't heard anything. But just about eight months after he'd been sent off in a cart, he turned up at home again in with a peg leg. They'd had to remove the bottom half of his leg and um, they'd given, fitted him up with a peg leg. So there he was with the peg leg and by that time the um, neighbours had raised a subscription and the family had managed to buy a small piece of land. So between his wife and um, himself and the children, they set together and started making a farm and that was a good a good income a good way for him to earn a living because obviously he couldn't go back to bush felling so there you go it's amazing what happens um now how about i play you another song here we have um 
a song from You, Me, Everybody, who called themselves a progressive bluegrass band. They're all New Zealanders. Um, two of them are still quite young. They're still um, in the late teens, early 20s. And uh, two of the, th the three others are a little bit older. Um, it's... They are absolutely great singer-songwriters and all their tracks are original. They're actually touring Australia at the moment and they're going to some of the early folk festivals and then I believe they're back in Melbourne this weekend and they're I'm keeping up with them on Facebook and they look like they're having a wonderful time. So if you know of anyone in Melbourne, tell them to go see You, Me, Everybody because they're pretty cool. So here we have You, Me, Everybody and you might recognise this tune. Stranger at your door I come and go from time to time And there is no end for But if you were to venture on Further down the line Why won't you greet the stranger In your mind Now I think it's time to go Walking it ain't easy when you bear a heavy load Faces can't tell no lies, I know just how to breathe Look deep inside the stolen dream and maybe you will see Troubled man and takes pain away. You only know me as the stranger at your door. I come and go from time to time, and there is nothing more. But if you were to venture on further down the line Why won't you greet the stranger in the back of your mind? There we go, 
that was Stranger by You, Me, Everybody and New Zealand Bluegrass, Progressive Bluegrass Band. And that's also the theme tune for the programme Sweet Tooth. So if you're into watching Sweet Tooth, you might have recognised it. Sweet Tooth is a, um, it's about a young man who's a cross between a human and a deer. And it's, of course, set in an imaginary world, because I can't imagine that's ever going to be possible. So um, there you go. Um, I thought I would um, read a piece about the um, vast changes in transport during 100 years that was written in this um, facsimile of the Cobblestones Chronicle newspaper, which was produced in, um, a, in the 1970s. And... Um, was a it was a fundraiser so they sold copies of it so vast changes of transport during the past 100 years as early as 1849 sir frederick weld wrote now the wairarapa contains some dozen good houses fenced enclosures wheat fields bridges drains etc rude carts are to be seen on the roads drawn by horses and oxen and on the river, the smartly painted whale boat with its load of wool and stores has begun to replace the long snake-like canoe painted dark red with its prow adorned with curious carving and plumes and manned by swarthy paddlers who used to make the forest echo with their yelling boat songs. And so with the passage of time, transport methods changed. Pack horse and pack bullet, bullock were followed by bullock and horse wagons, the spring cart, the cob and cow coach, and of course, Cobblestones was famous as being the hub for cob and cow coaches in the one wrapper. The solid tired motor vehicle, and then the pneumatic tired vehicle. It is important to note that before the foundation of the Wairarapa small farm settlements of Greytown and Masterton in 1854, and for some years after Castle Point first settled in 1848, was an important distribution centre. The portage there served a considerable area. In later years, the uncertainty in shipping wool diverted the wool trade from that portage. There was a coastal route. All the early traffic on land between Wellington and Napier used the East Coast Beach as a road, Castle Point being about halfway between. The first travellers from Wellington to Napier followed the beach to Cape Palliser and then went on up the coast. Later, with a settlement taking place in the lower Wairarapa and tracks were opened, the route was through Martinborough and Hinakura and down the Paharoa River to the coast and then northwards. After Masterton was settled in 1854, tracks were established from Castle Point and most of the traffic took that route. After the Warimia River Ferry was closed in 1882, traffic ceased on the beach route. My goodness, it's quite, um, you know, it's amazing to think that the, um, the way the traffic went was changed quite often. In 1843, the track of the room attackers was blazed by Samuel Breeze of the New Zealand Land Company from the Paruku Atahi River to Featherston, and in 1854, the forming of the track was begun in earnest. An excellent account of conditions in the Rumataka in 1854-55 was given by the Rapa's pioneer roadmaker, John Hall of Greytown, who in 1884 wrote his memoirs. 
Hall and his gang were working on the Mangaroa side of the Rumatakas in 1855 when the big earthquake of that year occurred. Thomas Kempton, who was Greyhound's first settler, was, was um, there when Hall first visited Greytown in 1854. And Thomas stated that the 1854 track over the hill was narrow and dangerous bridal path with high rocks above and below, with thousands of dead trees hanging down, and which was a big danger in windy weather. Kempton also wrote that in 1855 the earthquake broke away the road in parts and it was many weeks before a pack horse could use it. So bad enough that the road was pretty rough but then the earthquake came and um, didn't, didn't help a little bit. So I thought I'd play a song called Rain and Tears. It's um, again by a New Zealand artist who tells stories and it's a great song because it tells stories of um, what happens in the rain. And I thought, well, that seems quite appropriate after talking about the bridal track disappearing. So here we go, Rain and Tears by Alan Downs. Mm -hmm. Look out the window, rain is falling down Been six long months now since I last heard that sound I hear you've been travelling, made your name in Spain Freshened up the landscape on some far distant plain You've seen the rainforest on the other side of the world Disasters of nature where your name is often heard I've been looking for you, babe Talking to the sky Staring to the distance Hoping you drop by Looking for you, darling I've been down on my knees Revisiting daydreams that once belonged to you and me Does my name reach out and touch you From the lips of other men Does memory ever call you back The voices in your head Do you remember the back pattern Well there's an empty duck pond now Do you remember the car wickers As the sun was going down I've been listening to the wind Wander through the trees That little stand of larch we found it down by the stream I've been aching for you babe Missing you so much The whisper of your presence The caress of your touch Thinking of you darling I've been calling out your name So hard to live without you Hard to believe I'll see you again Well the sun burns through the window from a landscape pale and bland Your absence is well noted by the barrenness of land The chicken's gone off laying The old cow's lost the milk Dogs lie in the shadows of the trees as they wilt I've been looking for you, babe Looking for you, girl Looking in the mirror at a stranger I don't know there's a faraway expression in those sad grey old eyes A furrow in the forehead, curly hair used to hide I've been thinking of you lady, thinking of the time When I last saw you, you were a friend of mine I've been thinking of you darling, remembering your name I wish there was something I could do Bring you back again And now look out the window Rain is falling down 
Been six long months now since I last heard that sound. But here you are again, like it was only yesterday. You slipped out the back door last time you went away. Arms outstretched, I hold you, are they raindrops in my eyes? I love you when I'm with you, though I will never understand why. I've been aching for you, babe Missing you so much The whisper of your presence The caress of your touch Thinking of you, darling I've been calling out your name So hard to live without you It's hard to believe I'll see you again Thinking of you, darling Calling out your name so hard to live without you, it's hard to believe I'll never see you again. A sad song to, um, to celebrate the passing of a person, tears and rain. And I guess that happened quite a lot. Um, in our early settler days because people didn't live as long or as well as, as we did. You know, often people were um, challenged with their health and of course it was tough going. So um, crossing the Rumatakas, the first load of goods carted over the Rumatakas according to Thomas Kempton was that brought by himself on 7th of July, 1856, when he drove four bullocks and a dray with a ton of goods from Featherstone. It was a risky undertaking and it was two or three weeks later before anyone covered the same ground. Kempton believed that either Charles Cundy or Charles White was the next to follow with two horses and a cart loaded with half a ton of goods. And when you imagine what it w would have been like driving bullocks, uh, we have a photo at home of uh, one of my husband's great-great-uncles. Uh, in fact, I think it might be the one that he's named after, Niels. Um, he was a, a bullock uh, driver, and he's got this line of bullocks. There's three of them in a line with a huge log behind them on a, a cart and it's and he's walking along beside them and it's obviously quite tough to get them to go so I mean it must have been extraordinary um there's another uh, there's another uh, story here about bullet carts the Chamberlain family came to Masterton also as a result of the 1855 earthquake which had wrecked their house at Makara. They travelled by bullock cart to Mangaroa and packed the rest of the way to Burlings. After setting up accommodation in Masterton, three of the boys returned to Wellington to buy a cart, bullock and harness. On the return journey, the cart was unloaded at Mangaroa, dismantled. The body of the cart was strapped onto the bullock and the two wheels were trundled by two of the boys from Mangaroa to Burlings. The going was worse downhill than uphill and the boys' arms ate for weeks. At Burlings, which was a stop on the way, the cart was reassembled. So Burnley's was um, the north side of the Rumatakas, and I believe it was a kind of a stopping place. The use of pack bullocks over the Rumatakas was not as easy as it first appears. When Mr Henry Jones brought his family to Masterton from Wellington, the bullock began to buck on the Rumatakas and fell down a gully. So it must have been fairly perilous. 
1859, the Rimataka Hill Road remained perilous and often coaches were snowed up or blown over. Between Wellington and Masterton, there were four toll gates and numerous fords to negotiate. The introduction of carbon coast coaches began in the days of the Roaring Fifties in Victoria, when in December 1853, four Americans commenced coaching as Cobb & Co. Freeman Cobb was the best known of the four. When the service was extended to the Wairarapa, light Concord coachings were used. They were made to a pattern produced in 1827 by J.S. Abbott of Concord, New Hampshire, that's the USA, and pronounced as the only perfect passenger vehicle for travelling that has ever been built. That pattern remained the fixed standard for American trips of coaches ever since. Oh my goodness. The first Cobb coach between Masterton and Wellington was operated in 1866 by Mr Forrester and in 1867 by Messrs Wallace and Thomas Ray, and they ran a four-horse coach driven by Mr. Ray. Mr. Hastwell of Greytown bought out Mr. Forrester and for a time had the road to himself, but when opposition came in the fair from Wellington to Masterton, reduced to 10 shillings. In 1865, Hastwell and Thomas Walker had wagons, wagons on the road and Mrs. Henry Bannister and A.W. Cave had a six-horse wagon driven by Cave. Later, the MacDonald, Job, Vile and Cundy operated six-horse wagons. Wow, they must have gone a bit faster. And, and mind you, I don't know if they really wanted to go faster. In the 60s and 70s, wagon drivers included George Salisbury, Dick Saver, Pat Crockery, Harry Crozier, George Phillips, Bill Darnley, Joe Raisin, Bill Thompson. Oh, goodness, there's a whole list of them. There's lots of them. Bannister and Cave had three bullock teams of 12 to carry between Masterton and the outlying stations, and the drivers were George Shute, Jim Smith and Ted Hall. Oh dear, Raisin was killed in the Tarutahi Road in 1874. And it just, it's amazing to think that all these people were, and there's a whole page of them here, were part of were bullock train drivers or coach drivers and they the whole um, line of coaches was quite amazing um, there was there's a lovely ad here for a line of coaches between Martinborough, Morrison's Bush and Greytown connecting with Carterton and Masterton or you could go from Martinborough, Greytown and Masterton direct. How exciting. Planning a trip in those days was a little more than picking up the phone, because of course they didn't have phones out here, but at least. So it must have been always very exciting. And of course there was always, when you think about um, coach rides, in the original Cobb and Co, which was of course the United States of America and across the, pra the prairies, you always think of them being held up by masked men. So I'm going to play a tune by um, You Me Everybody again. This one's called Wrong Side of the Law. Just seemed appropriate. <laughs> Bye. 
sober trip by my friends Tomorrow I hang from the gallows Nothing left to lose on the wrong side of the law Gonna keep on going till I can't go no more Nothing left to lose when you know you're gonna die I'll slip that noose around my neck and kiss the world goodbye Can be a cruel place like the men that bought the land. My still find guilty of the death of many men. My story will be told for many years to come. I won't be forgotten in death, my song is sung. Oh, there's nothing left to lose on the wrong side of the road. Gonna keep on going till I can't go no more. Wrong Side of the Law by You, Me, Everybody. I don't think they're all on the wrong side of the law, <laughs> but um, they obviously really enjoyed um, writing and singing that song. Um, so just before I finish up for today, um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about this book I've been reading, which is Touring Edwardian New Zealand by Professor Paul Moon, who is a an excellent historian and who has written several books but this one is delightful because it gives us an insight into what it was like and um, he has to, he talks about um, he uses a lot of quotes from the handbook Thomas Cook's handbook for touring New Zealand and um, there's some gorgeous pictures in this book and if you're watching on TV, I'm holding them up now and one of them is seeing the Days Bay Pavilion uh, which of course is at Days Bay and it's still uh, there today because a lot of Wellington, like many a Victorian and Wardian era towns was built round the water because it was the best uh, trans the best form of transport really 
And it was a lovely day out to get the ferry across to Days Bay and um, have some time in a holiday home in Days Bay or Eastbourne, perhaps. And the Days Bay Pavilion had lots of entertainment. And I think what's lovely is that the current owners of Days Bay on Sunday afternoons very often have a live band there and Wellington based bands usually. So I really recommend um, checking them out and, you know, maybe taking a wee trip down to the buzz of Days Bay at the top end of Lower Hutt. <laughs> there you go. There was also, they also talked about uh, the woolen manufacturing company in Petoni, which they've got a picture of in the book as well and it was huge it was an absolutely huge factory with a great big chimney just amazing so the um, handbook's final recommendations for Wellington suggest that its authors might have been running out of ideas because it's proposed that of the city's industries, the visitor, if he should feel interested in such, can inspect at Pitoni woolen and freezing works companies. This was around a 14-kilometre trip from Wellington, and for those who were interested, as the handbook put it, the Woolen Manufacturing Company was open to visitors at certain times and even boasted of its attractions to tourists. So what it said about it in the handbook, before visitors reach the well-appointed graceful chimney, the best of its kind in the colony, strikes their attention preparing them for one of the best equipped and largest woolen and worsted mills in New Zealand. Two gigantic Lancashire boilers, 30 feet by 8, fitted with every appliance up to date for economy and efficiency, give steam to the new engine, 500 horsepower, which has replaced the old one of 240 horsepower. It was fitted with all the latest improvements, including an electric stop motion which can be operated by the youngest employee from any part of the mill in case of accident, bringing the engine to a standstill. The flywheel is 16 feet in diameter, weighs 16 tonnes and makes six, se 75 revolutions a minute. Uh, as Paul says in his book, this is the sort of attraction that perhaps just a handful of tourists would be genuinely fascinated by. Nevertheless, it was included in the list of Wellington's places of interest for Thomas Cook travellers staying in the city. It was possible to coax them to remain an extra day or two in the capital before departing for the South Island leg of the tour. Personally speaking, I would say, looking at this photograph, the um, ladies in hats and the throng outside Days Bay Pavilion looked like a much better, much better bet for a bit of a party. And talking of parties, please save the date on the 16th of December. So we're going to have the annual celebration at Cobblestones. Carols at Cobblestones. What better way to kick off the festive season? I gather that we're going to have um, Dragonfly playing, Meg Hunter, Jack Brown and a few other surprise guests. So please put the date in your diary, bring a picnic or we'll have our usual delicious food and we'll have a cash bar. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. And anytime you're in Cobblestones, do ask um, if Jeanette's around, if you'd like to come and say hello. I'd love to chat with you. So that's it for me for this week. I hope you have a great week ahead and I hope the weather continues improving as I came into the studio today. There was a glint of sunshine in the sky. Take care everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>